Good afternoon, everyone. If you could try to find a seat and we'll get started. Um, I'm Paul McRae from the University of Iowa, and with me is Deepika Polanani from uh, Washington University, and we're, we're co-chairing this session this afternoon on restoration of CFTR and transport for all people with CF. Um, so we're going to go ahead and get started. We've got four speakers on four diverse topics. Should be interesting, and we hope we have a lively discussion uh, this afternoon. And my co-chair will like to uh, make a few remarks also. Thank you all. I'm so excited about our session today and our speakers and their fantastic topics. The format that we're going to honor is 20 minutes of speaking time followed by five minutes of questions. And we are going to go a little bit out of order uh, because Dr. Batsheva Karim was unable to attend the conference in person uh, but has joined us virtually to be able to present her science and take Q&A. Um, because of that time zone difference between here and where she is in Israel, we clearly want to honor her attendance and then let her uh, get back to her early hours of the morning. Um, so with that, we'll uh, start. And so let me just get her talk loaded for you all. I did want to actually express my thanks um, for Dr. Karam doing this. She has clearly led our scientific community since the discovery of CFTR. And so for her to continue to join us and present her science despite uh, the difficulties, we really wanted to express that thanks. So hello, everybody. I would like first to thank the organizers for inviting me to present our data. And here are my disclosures. I am the scientific founder and now the chief scientific officer of Splicense. But before I start to present our data, I would like to relate to what happened on October 7, just a few weeks ago. On that day, over 1,400 Israelis were brutally murdered by Hamas' barbaric act of terrorism. Civilians and soldiers butchered, babies beheaded, women cruelly raped. And in addition, 230 were kidnapped. Among them, 80 children that we can see here on the right, aged six months to 16 years old. You know, uh, I would like to get back to science. And as we all know, 10 to 50% of the patients do not respond to the current available CFTR modulators. And this includes patients carrying class one mutation, mainly mainly stop mutations, in patients serving class five mutations, mainly non-canonical splicing mutations. So human genes, most of them are comprised of coding sequences defined as exons, separated by non-coding sequences defined as introns. In the first step of transcription, both exon and introns are transcribed, are copied into the pre-messenger RNA. The next step is that introns are removed by the splicing mechanism. And by this, exons are joined to generate the messenger RNAs. The splicing me mechanism is mediated by essential sequence motifs, also known as canonical sites. This is the donor and the acceptor sites, and other sequences flanking the canonical sequences, which are non-canonical, shown here in blue. There are several CFTR splicing mutations disrupting non-canonical motifs. And there are 4,000 CF patients carrying at least one copy of these mutations in the registries of the US and Europe. And I listed here 
the most common non-canonical splicing mutation in the CFTR gene, and we are studying two of them. So let's start from the first mutation, the 3849 plus 10 KBC2T mutation. It's a C2T change in intro 22, which generates an aberrant novel donor splice site. As a result, 84 base pairs in the intro are now recognized as an exon, and they are included in the, spli in the spliced transcript. These 84 base pairs carry an in-frame stop coder, and therefore there is degradation of the transcript by the NMD mechanism, and no protein are produced. Despite the mutation in most patients, some normal splicing occur, and this normal splicing is leading to full-length functional CFTR protein. Years ago, we have found a strong correlation between the level of correct splicing and lung function. And this led us to hypothesize that modulation of the splicing may affect disease severity. Can this be translated to drug development? This is our aim. And the way we are trying to modulate splicing is by using antisense oligonucleotides or for sure, for short, ASOs. These are single-stranded RNA-like sequences that can bind to their target at the RNAs and change splicing. They are specific to their target, and by this can avoid off-target effects. They are chemically modified for increasing their stability and cell uptake, and they are very relevant clinically as several splice switching ASO based drugs are already approved for other genetic diseases. So splicin was found to develop inhaled ASO based drugs for CF and for other pulmonary diseases. So for the 3849 mutation, the aim is to, ident to design and identify an ASO that will inhibit the recognition of the 84 base pairs as a cryptic exon. This will promote only normal splicing and functional CFTR proteins. In SpliceSense, we developed an in-house algorithm for designing antisense oligonucleotide, and we and we designed a set of ASOs around the 3849 cryptic exon. And we first analyzed the effect of the ASOs on the splicing pattern. In FRED cells, flipped in with the CFTR3 DNA carrying either the wild type or the 3849 mutation in collaboration with C4. So when the normal sequence is expressed, all RNA is correctly spliced. When the 3849 plasmid is expressed, all the RNA is aberrantly spliced, like in the very severe patients. And we can see here examples of several, several of our ASO resulting in high levels of correctly spliced CFTR transcript. The ASOs also lead to the generation of mature CFTR protein, as can be seen here in FET cells and in HEC293 cells. Next, we analyze the effect of the lead ASOs on the CFTR function in primary respiratory epithelial cells from patients carrying the 3849 mutation. And the initial experiments were performed in Isabel Sermet's lab in Paris, and we can see here a trace from the Ossing chamber following in blue control ASO, no CFTR activation, and in yellow, our lead ASO, SPL84. And we can see that 
um, following the addition of phoscholine, we see a very significant activation of the CFTR function, which is specific to the CFTR and is reduced by a specific inhibitor. Uh, RNA was extracted from the same cells from the filters that were measured by the OSIN chamber. Um, RNA was extracted and we analyzed the splicing patterns. So control ASO shows that most of the RNA in cells that were treated with control ASO, we see that most of the RNA is aberrantly spliced, whereas following SPL84 treatment, most of the RNA, if not all the RNA, is now correctly spliced. And here is a summary of a very a large body of data in respiratory epithelial cells of patients. So here are the results from HBEs derived from a homozygote patient for the 3849 mutation. And we can see a very significant activation of the CFDR channel reaching 90 or so percent of wild type levels. Here are the results from HBEs derived from a heterozygote patient carrying one 3849 ID, and we can see a very significant activation of the CFTR channel. And the same results we, we achieved in HMEs, in this case for five different heterozygote patients. Again, very significant activation of the CFTR channel. More recently, Experiment with SPL84 were performed in the CFFT lab headed by Martin Menz. So they have analyzed the effect of SPL84 in heterozygote HBEs as well as in homozygote HBEs. And as can be seen here, the results show in both type of HBEs that SPL84 is leading to a significant restoration of the CFTR activity, reaching the wild type range. In addition, in these experiments, the ASOs were administrated either basolateral, as in the previous result that I have shown, or on the apical side, to the apical side, which is a, a model a better model for inha inhalation of ASO. And what we can see is that the apical administration in the heterozygote and the homozygote HBEs also led to full restoration of the CFDR activity, indicating that the ASO can <coughs> penetrate the cells, reach the nucleus, and affect the RNA splicing. <clears throat> Another set of, of experiments was aimed to compare the effect of SPL84 on the, on the 3849 allele to that of Trikafta. So Trikafta in homozygote cells did not show any effect on the CFTR function. This confirmed our previous results that were already published. Interestingly, in heterozygote HBE, Treating with Trikafta targeting the F508 del resulted in a nice activation, apical or basolateral administration. However, the effect of SPL84 targeting the 3849 allele was superior. We can see it here in the blue bars when the antisense was administrated basolateral and also on the apical, uh, apical side of the cells, in the low concentration, the response was similar to Trikafta, but in the higher concentration, it was significantly higher. And another point that we can see in these experiments, that the combination of both treatment, SPL84 and Trikafta, did not add any uh, better, any activation to the effect of the SPL84 by itself. 
both in the apical or the basal lateral administration. So this is for the 3849 mutation, and I, at the end of the lecture, I will get back to, to the mutation. The second mutation that we are working on, which is a non-canonical splicing mutation, is the 2789 plus 5 G2A mutation. This is a change in position plus 5, which affects the donor splice site and leads to exon 16 skipping. Exon 16 is not in frame, and skipping over the exon is leading to a frame shift. This results in the degradation of the transcript by the nonsense mediated decay mechanism and no CFTR protein production. So our aim in this project is to avoid, to inhibit skipping over exon 16, what is called exon retention. And for this, we designed using our in-house algorithm, a set of ASOs, and we identified several ASOs shown here in the RT-PCR experiment and qPCR experiment that are leading to a significant level of exon 16 retention. And we are now progressing with the project. And now I would like to show results aiming to correct class one mutations, stop mutations. And we focus on the W1282X mutation, which resides in exon 23 because it's a nonsense mutation, the transcript I degraded by the NMD, and there is no truncated protein production. And our solution, or our aim for correction is by ASO-based therapy, and we are aiming to lead to skipping over exon 23, which harbor how was the W1282X mutation? And the rationale behind this is that exon 23 with the mutation is part of NBD2, which is folded post translation and is not required for stable assembly and escape from the ER quality control. Now, several groups have shown that. CFTR proteins lacking the entire NBD2 have partial activity that can be augmented by the CFTR modulators. And this led us to hypothesize that promoting skipping over exon 23 by ASO treatment might correct the aberrant function of this mutation. And there are two more points to consider. Exon 23 is in frame and therefore can be removed, can be skipped without causing frame shift of the operability frame. This is different from what we saw previously for exon 16. And another important point is that skipping over exon 23 with the mutation will bypass the NMD and we generate transcript that can be hopefully modulated by also by modulators by Tricafta. So with CFTR proteins lacking exon 23 can and they be functional. So first we designed antisense and analyzed their effect on the slicing pattern. And we can see here several of the uh, ASOs leading to almost complete skipping over exon 23. Uh, the result of the generation of transcript lacking exon 23 led to the formation of CFTR proteins 
no proteins at all due to the NMD, as we discussed, following controllers of treatment, but following the administration of our best ASOs, we see a significant level of mature CFTR proteins. Of course, they are lacking exon 23. So then we analyze the effect of these ASO and the lead ASO, SPL23-2, on CFTR function in Osin chamber analysis. So we can see that on the RNA level, SPL23 in these HMEs led to a significant skipping of exon 23. And together with Trikafta, it led to a significant activation of the CFTR function in a homozygote patient and also in a heterozygote patient. So this is for the W1282X at the moment. And in the last part of my talk, I, as splicing is developing ASOs and head drugs, I would like to describe how splicing tackles the key challenges of lung delivery. We did a lot of work in tissue culture, in vitro, and also in animal models, both in mice and in non-human primates. And I will just, because of lack of time, show only some results. So let's look at what we found in mice, either white type mice or mice or beta enoch mice, which are a model for CF-like glucose mice, following the administration of our lead ASO. So we can see that 24 hours post the dosing, we can see a wide distribution of the ASO in the entire lung. This is the, the dark gray staining. And when we looked at specific regions within the lung, both in the wild type mice and in the beta enoch mice, we can see that in each of the lung part, trachea, bronchi, etc., we do see the ASO. And interestingly, also four weeks post the dosing, we still can see very nice staining, which is indicating that there is a wide and efficient distribution and stability. One aim is to get the ASO to the nucleus. So here we can see section of the lung epithelial cells from the mice that were <clears throat> I, they are administrated with the ASO by IT. In blue, we can see the nuclei of the cells. And the images are from a confocal microscope. And the plane is only the nuclei. So here are the nuclei. In green, we can see the ASO. And this ASO is for the 2849 project. And we can see very, very nicely the ASO in the nuclear here is the image. Then we analyze the distribution in only one primates lungs by inhalation. And uh, in this case, we analyzed the, uh, the ASO four weeks post the dose. So we can see a very nice and uniform distribution along the non-human primates lung. We can see the staining here in dark brown in the different sections of the lung, in globals, in goblet cells, in ciliated cells, etc. So we see a uniform labeling in all sample section. <clears throat> And respiratory epithelium and alveolar cells are all very well labeled. So 
for the 3849 ASO, we proved that it is completely restoring the CFTR activity and it has a potential for cure since the protein which is um, produced is a normal protein. We have demonstrated promising safety profile and didn't go into these experiments. And importantly, we just successfully completed phase one. We have shown that the antisense for the 3849 project was safe and well tolerated, even in the highest dose that we used. And there was very low systemic exposure and those dependency. We are now planning the phase two study, which will be semi-global in just very soon, in early 2024. It is a high priority study as graded by the TDM and the CTM. There will be weekly treatment and the nebulization time will be about eight minutes only. So I would like to thank the people that contributed to the project. This is my current lab and Michal and Nomi are contributing to the CF research. And these are people that in previously contributed to the development of the ASO based approach. And here is Splicen's team and uh, we thank the CROs, the toxicology cons consultants, the phase one unit in Hadassah Medical Center, and of course, the entire license team. And here are our collaborators, first all the center in Israel and in France. Isabel Sermet that I mentioned already, Eitan Kerem from Hadassah Medical Center, we couldn't do anything without Eitan. Steve Rowe, who helped us to initiate the project in fat cells, and Christine Baer, who contributed to the W1282X project. And I thank you for listening, and I will be happy to take questions. Dr. Karen, thank you so much for your talk, and we're opening it up to the audience for questions. Um, I'm Carla Ribeiro from UNC Chapel Hill, and Dr. Karen, thank you so much for giving this presentation. I am curious to know whether you have any um, initial evidence that the S ASO does decrease or ameliorate the phenotype from the bat and neck mouse from a mucoobstructive point of view. The experiment was not aimed at this at all, so we didn't look at this. But hopefully soon we will see the results in human. Okay, thank you. Uh, hi, Dr. Karam, this is Paul McCrave. Do you have any hi. notion on how the ASOs enter cells from the apical side versus the basal side? And have you had to make any specific chemical modifications to enhance their entry? So the antisense oligo is the same one with the same chemical modification, either uh, administrated via the basal side or the apical side. There was no change essentially in the protocol and you just have seen the result. We were very happy to see that the apical administration was very, very efficient. This, this is uh, Deepika Polanini, and I just had a question uh, about congratulations on the completion of your phase one study. And we know that these uh, strategies have been uh, hampered by inflammation uh, in inhalation in early phase studies in the past. What has your experience been like with uh, inflammation in your phase one study to date? So the phase one was uh, in healthy volunteers and there were no adverse events whatsoever. It was very, very clean. Uh, 
This is Paul McRae again. I just have to ask another question. Um, you sounded surprised that the you still saw an effect, or you could still detect the ASO at four weeks. Um, what what were your expectations, and why do you think it is still there at four weeks? The ASO is actually a very very stable small small molecule, right? If you can say it this way, it is chemically modified and. Can can be in, can be found in cells for months. For example, in SMA, in this SMA disease, the injection of the antisense oligonucleotide is twice a year, every six months. But for the SMA, the ASO is um, administrated to cells which are not, not dividing. Okay, in the lung. The cells are dividing, and by dividing, then the ISO is diluted. So uh, we were very happy to see that after four weeks, we do see a substantial staining of the ASO. So it means that the concentration, the dose that we use is, is a good dose, that after four weeks, we still, although the cells are dividing, uh, in the lung, we still see a very high level of the ASO, which hopefully will lead to a correction of the function long term. Dr. Karam, thank you so much for joining us and making such an effort to do so. Um, I think we all want to wish you our thanks um, and a restful rest of the night for you uh, before we close on this portion with you today. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Dr. Jennifer Taylor Kauser from National Jewish Health, and she's speaking on building the path to the cure, the role of AAV therapy. So thank you both very much for the invitation to present today. So I'll go back one. These are my disclosures. The most important one here is that I'm a national primary investigator for the 4D study. So our objectives today are first to address the why. We're here to talk about the science, but I think it's also really important for us to remember why we're talking about this science, to understand the historical efficacy and safety for AAV delivery, and then review data from ongoing and upcoming clinical trials. So several of you have seen this slide um, before. It's been shown by Dr. Clancy and Dr. Rowe yesterday. But we think that up to 94% of people can be treated with highly effective modulator therapy. Other therapies may be possible, as you just heard from Dr. Karam. Um, but I also think it's really critical for us to remember those who aren't eligible. And what we learned from data from the registry is that those who aren't eligible are likely to have lower lung function, lower income, and be on Medicare or Medicaid not be seen at a therapeutics development network site and identify as a person of color. So a vulnerable population within an already vulnerable population. And we have actually heard from people with CF. Emily's entourage surveyed over 400 people and their families with CF and asked them about how they felt about the fact that there were modulators that were available for some but not for them. And one parent said, the older my child becomes, the harder this disease becomes to manage physically and emotionally. It's extremely hard to watch as it takes over. Another person with CF said, I'm 42 and I feel like I'm running out of time. My only CF issue is my lungs. My last call with my doc, he said, I wish I had a modulator for you. Same doc, same. And then a partner said that I'm glad that many have access to CFTR modulators, but at the same time, I'm concerned for my partner. I worry that 90% coverage could be seen as good enough, and I worry about the effect being passed over by these incredible drugs has on my partner's ability to have well-being, both physically and mentally. So people are really suffering right now, and so I think we all need to keep that in mind as we talk about the desperate need for this group of people. 
So back in 1989, when the gene was discovered by a collaboration by, again, Dr. Karim, a uh, collaboration with Dr. Riordan, um, Dr. Francis Collins, and Yatlap Chi Choi, of course we thought, the community thought that CF gene therapy would be around the corner. And in fact, it actually went into the lab fairly quickly within a year after the gene was discovered. At that point, people thought that maybe if you could just transduce maybe six to 10% of the cells, then that might be therapeutic. There was a CF mouse generated, the first adeno trials actually went into humans, and it was realized pretty quickly that the immune system was a barrier, not only for actually transducing the cells, but it also caused an immune response in people taking the drug, and that was going to be limiting. And the last trial was around 2001 for adenovirus. People moved on to adeno-associated virus, and there were six trials with AAV2-based therapy in the upper and lower airways. There was nasal and sinus administration in three of the trials. There were about 34 participants who were dosed. It was safe and well-tolerated. DNA was detected, and in the nasal cavity, transgene expression was detected. There was also CFTR def uh, detection versus the contralateral control. Not a lot, but a little bit. They went on and looked at aerosol delivery to the lung. About 84 participants were dosed with mild to moderate disease. Again, it was safe and well tolerated. There was DNA detected, but there was no transgene expression detected and there was no change in lung function in the treated versus the controls. So people thought, well, you have to go back to the drawing board. We focused a lot on modulators here in the US, but people in the back of their minds were still thinking about some of these other issues. So in terms of preclinical data, which vector is the best one to use? And which cells do we need to target? Do we need to target every cell in the airway or just some of them? And importantly, what percent of the cells need to be transduced? And then what efficacy do we need to see in the preclinical models and animal models before we're safe, we think it's safe to move on and reasonable to move on to clinical trials? In the early phase studies, which efficacy measures do we need to use and which measures of inflammation are necessary given what we saw in the previous trials? And then finally, when we move on to the bigger clinical trials, again, what efficacy measures do we use? It was great with the modulators to use sweat tests, but we can't do that for a locally delivered therapy. Also, how much improvement is enough? So, of course, with Trikafta, we see, see these huge improvements in lung function. But with Lumiva and Teziva, or Cambian Simdico, we saw 2 to 4%, and that also was associated with a reduction in exacerbations and sort of a stopgap until we could get something better. So what improvement is enough for us to move a gene therapy forward? Also, which people with CF do we include? Only those who are not eligible? What about those who stopped because they had so many side effects? Or those who had a response that was great in terms of the number of exacerbations, but they didn't have a big lung function improvement? So there are also, there are a number of different vectors that could be used, but I'm here to talk about adeno-associated virus today as a vector. So what are some potential advantages? Compared to some of the other viruses, there's a lower risk of patho pathogenicity, the duration of expression, particularly in non-proliferating cells, is decent. There's a broad range of target organs based on the number of serotypes and a lack of a strong immune response to many of those. There's also a very low risk of insertional mutagenesis. But there are some disadvantages. So the AAV receptor is on the basolateral rather than the apical surface. There's small, relatively, genome packaging capacity. There's a potential for pre-existing or inducible antibodies. And at high-dose IV delivery, there is potential for hepatotoxicity. Also, it's unclear if repeat dosing is going to be possible. And I don't think I can keep going on with this lecture without talking about some of the safety issues that have been seen with very high-dose AAV therapy. So, some of you will be aware of this case back in 1999 that actually brought gene therapy trials to a screeching halt when a man with a metabolic condition actually died after getting high-dose AAV therapy. And more recently, there was a death in a patient with Duchenne muscular dystrophy. But I think it's important for us to realize in the CF world right now, what we're looking at is inhalational doses. The people who are dosed in these trials were getting the doses at vector genomes per kilo rather than a simple 1 times 10 to the 15 vector genome. So 
much, much higher doses than we're giving by inhalation. Not that we should dismiss any of this because we eventually do want to treat people with CF and treat all organs, but where we are right now is focusing on the inhalation and that's at much lower doses. I also think it's important for us to realize that there is really good hope for where we've come. You saw this in Dr. Rowe's presentation yesterday. We do already have AAV therapy approved for inherited vision loss, um, for people with SMA, and also more recently for people with hemophilia. So now I'll move on to talking a little bit about things that are already in trials or should soon be in trials. So. SP101 SP is an AAV gene therapy that was developed by Spirovant. It's a capsid that, was, capsid that was selected for tropism of human airway epithelial cells, and it's a mini gene in combination with the capsid. They showed efficient apical entry, and then they were able to actually enhance the translocation to the nucleus by co-administration with doxorubicin. And that with that, they've seen increased uh, delta CFTR expression. So first they looked in polarized primary human CF airway epithelial cells. In this case, they had two nonsense mutations. They looked at short circuit assay by using, um, using chamber measurement, and they basically exposed them for 16 hours and then did an analysis at day seven. And you can see that there was actually a dose dependent improvement in CFTR function when SP101 was administered with doxorubicin. They also, because there is some cross-reactivity, were able to look at this in the ferret model. So they looked at both wild type and CF ferrets and administered one dose of the drug. They looked um, at the ferrets at days 14 and at day 90. And what you can see in this first graph is looking at the number of mRNA copies on the y-axis and the day on the x-axis, that there was actually an improvement in the number of mRNA copies with administration, particularly with the higher dose and in conjunction with doxorubicin. And they were actually able to achieve wild type levels. And particularly, it was out to day 90, they still saw these high levels. They also showed that they could give it to both the CF ferrets and the wild type ferrets and see that you could still get expression. So the thick mucus in the airways was not a barrier to treatment. So now we'll move on to talking about the one that's actually in trials right now, and that's the AAV therapy by 4D. So again, with the old vectors, we saw that there was inefficient transduction, too much immune stimulation, and the goal with this new development of this new capsule was really to try to overcome some of those barriers. So with A101, it was selected for its efficient mucus penetration, resistance to pre-existing human AAV antibodies, efficient transgene expression, and specificity for the lung. And so it's combined with a transgene and the drug 47T designed is the one that we're trialing right now. So this is a look at the trial design. The phase one is where we are right now. So cohort one is a dose of one times 10 to the 15th vector genomes. Cohort two was two times 10 to the 15th vector genomes. And then cohort three is five times uh, 10 to the uh, vector genomes. And then looking at phase two, we'll be deciding which dose we need to move forward based on the safety and efficacy we see in these first three cohorts. So patients are actually screened for 28 days. They're given a dose of prednisone the day before they start, and then they taper their prednisone down over 28 days. During this administration, uh, one-day administration, they're actually doing serial PFTs, and then they get PFTs for 28 days afterwards. We do a bronchoscopy at day 28, and then continue to follow their PFTs out to month 12, and then we'll follow them for an additional year based on FDA requirements. So this is looking at the cohorts so far. You can see that the age range was 20 to 69. There was about a half and half ratio of males to females. 
at this point, unfortunately, we have only non-Hispanic whites who are not yet able to recruit people of other races, but we continue to work on that. Most people were actually ineligible for CFTR modulators. There is actually, um, there were two patients who were intolerable of CFTR modulators and they are eligible in this trial. You can see that most of them had nonsense mutations. Their historic sweat chlorides were consistent with those mutations. In terms of their percent predicted FV1, they range from moderate disease of 56% all the way up to 94%, so relatively mild disease. Their CFQR respiratory domain scores were pretty high at baseline, and again, that's consistent with their level of lung disease. Of note, two of the people did actually have pre-existing antibodies. So this is, again, this is a phase one study, so we're primarily looking at safety. And this is showing serial spirometry for cohorts one and cohorts two. And you can see that there wasn't a decrease in sp spirometry post-administration. There were a couple of adverse events that were mild, mild dry throat and rhinorrhea and cough that resolved on the day of administration. This slide is actually looking at longer term safety of the participants out to 17 months in cohort one, a shorter period of time in cohort two because these were done sequentially. And you can see that for the most part, it was quite safe and well tolerated. But I do wanna go into a little bit more detail for participant three in cohort two. So there was one serious adverse event in cohort two in a 33-year-old female with a baseline FV1 of 80%. She had a history of chronic bacterial infection requiring IV oral and um, antibiotics and hospitalizations about once to twice a year. She was on alternating month TOBI and had uh, everyday azithromycin administration. Three weeks after her dose administration, she had the onset of dyspnea, a decrease in her FV1 and in her oxygen saturations. Her high-res CT at that time showed centrolobular nodularity and ground glass opacities. The radiologist read it as atypical infection and cryptogenic organizing pneumonia. She was hospitalized, treated with oxygen and increased prednisone because it was presumed to be possibly related to drug, and then she was discharged within 72 hours. She actually returned back at the request of the investigators so that they could perform a bronchoscopy, and that was actually done, and she had 700,000 colony former units of her previous bacteria, which was eyelamosis. So she was prescribed a two-week course of IV imipenem, or miropenem. Her clinical laboratory and CT findings were consistent with some of the published reports on islamosis pneumonia in people with CF in the past. And this um, was actually assessed by the investigator as possibly related to study treatment. Her symptoms actually resolved and her baseline FV1 returned at about week 10 after treatment. So in addition to safety, we were also looking for expression. So on the left, you see that there were samples done from bronchoscopy. There were both brushings and biopsy in cohorts one and cohorts two. All of the samples by ISH actually showed the transgene by RNA or transgene RNA. So you can see the brown staining um, in both cohort one and cohort two participants. And there's a negative control CF lung on the bottom. We also looked at immunohistochemistry, so looking for protein. And you can see on the left that there were actually high levels of protein in both cohort one and cohort two participants. We also looked at normal lung and CF lung as controls. Using VisioPharm software, quantitative measurements were made as well, and you can see that they were quite high in the, both participants in cohort one and in cohort two compared to the normal lungs and the CF lungs. And that's also shown in staining in brown on the bottom. So just to summarize the interim safety and the transgene expression data, 100% of the lung samples from these participants were positive by ISH and by IHC. So 34 samples in total, bronchial specimens, both by biopsy and by brushing. 
There were large airway biopsies, samples were 13, and smaller airway brushings in 12, or of 21. The CFTR levels actually were five-fold higher by IHC than in normal controls. There was no difference in this expression between mid and high dose. We saw that it was generally safe and well tolerated in four to 17 months of follow up, depending on whether it was a cohort one or cohort two patient. There was no inflammation or toxicity in the tissue samples observed in the lung biopsies. There was one SAE that was consistent with infection with islamosis, which was her baseline infection. Again, she was hospitalized for approximately 72 hours, treated with antibiotics, a steroid taper, and then had subsequent resolution. In terms of dose selection, the mid-dose level is what's been selected for further evaluation in phase two, and we've already dosed an additional patient. The high dose is pending further evaluation of follow-ups by Rometry in all the cohort four participants. And then a lower dose, um, we've also dosed one participant with a lower dose, is also being evaluated. So it is a phase one, two trial, so mostly we're looking at safety and looking for the transgene expression, but we did do some measures of efficacy as well. So one of them was looking at the patient reported outcome of CFQR respiratory domain. You can see in the three participants in um, cohort one that their scores actually did improve and stayed relatively high throughout the 12 month follow up. This is just a summary looking at the mean change of those three participants over the 12 months. Again, it was improved and remained relatively improved over the course of the, of the trial, and it's above the minimally clinically important difference of four. Also looking at lung function for the first cohort on whom we have follow-up data on all of the participants out to 12 months. So participants one and three actually had quite high baseline lung functions, 83 to 95%, and they maintained their lung function over the course of the 12 months. Participant two had a lower lung function, so a baseline FV1 of 69%, and his FV1 actually increased in month one, which of course he was on steroids, and that may be contributing, but you can see that over the course of the 12 months, in spite of having two respiratory infections, including COVID, his lung function remained 5% above baseline at 12 months. So in terms of next steps, as I mentioned, we're going to be looking at lower doses to see what the minimal effective dose in fact is. We're continuing to dose people at the one times 10 to the 15 vector genomes and have initiated enrollment at the five times 10 to the 14th vector genomes. Our target really is to have normal levels of CFTR protein expression in the airway. And again, we, see, we have seen by immunohistochemistry quite high levels thus far. And so again, we're looking for the minimal effective dose. In terms of the pivotal design, obviously that's under a lot of debate. How do you move forward in this very small population and make sure we have enough people in the study to see a difference, but don't use subjects unnecessarily. So we're continuing to work with both the FDA and the CF Foundation on the pivotal trial design. The other question, as I mentioned earlier in the talk, is whether or not we actually offer this to people who have had a suboptimal response to CFTR modulators, and that is still under discussion as well. So in conclusion, we obviously have highly effective therapy for about 90% of people, but it's not a cure even for those who are benefiting. We've also learned a number of lessons from the previous AAV gene therapy trials, and those lessons along with improved technology are allowing us to achieve transgene expression in the lower airways in people with CF for the first time in the history of the disease. There'll be ongoing and upcoming trials that will really increase our understanding of the level and durability of clinical improvement that's possible with these drugs. So with that, I'll say thank you to all the participating sites including the mentored PI, Dr. Dorgan. And then thanks, of course, to the people with CF and their families who are participating in these trials and all of the other investigators, as well as the CF sites who are actually referring people in because obviously not every site is able to do these studies. And with that, I'll stop and take any questions.
We'll open it up to the audience for questions. It, uh, hey, Jay. Jay Coles, too. Great yeah. talk. And I'm, I'm glad you've mentioned the issue of um, health disparities, which is very important at our center, too, where we have a very eth ethnically diverse uh, CF population. Um, you mentioned cough was one of the adverse events. And can you just clarify, was that during vector administration? And if so, was it, uh, was it medically managed? Uh, there wasn't any need for treatment. It was a minimal cough, but yeah, it's administered over time. And so during that time, there was cough, but then by the end of the administration, it resolved. So, so you don't think it affected like drug delivery or anything like that? No, I don't think so. Uh, John McDyer, Pittsburgh. There was a nice talk. Um, in your staining, your immunohistochemistry staining mm -hmm. on the transbronchial biopsies, it it looked like the normal lung was not lighting up for CFTR. Uh, did I? Uh, but the but the transgene samples were. I didn't quite understand that. Yeah, I mean, unfortunately, it's really technically difficult to do ISH and IHC on the same samples, and so that yet hasn't yet been done. But we are, we totally acknowledge that the staining is not typical, and that's why we looked at CF lung and um, normal lung to see why there's so much lighting up outside of where we'd normally see it. We just don't know the answer at this point. And the ISH was done on the, on the brush cells? It was done on the brush cells, yeah. Okay. So that's why it's just technically like you just can't do both assays. Yeah. And unfortunately, we don't have a way to functionally measure at this point since LAPD is not yet up to speed. Um, Patrick Harrison, Cork in Ireland. Um, you mentioned about the fivefold higher levels of CFTR and that you're striving to bring it back to normal. So one approach you're considering is to reduce the dose, but do you think you'll have to go back to the promoter to achieve that result? No, we're, we've just lowered the dose. So we, you know, we went from one times 10 to the 15th vector genomes to two times 10 to the 15th, and now we're doing one at five times 10 to the 14th. But do you have any plans to look at the promoter again to see if that will bring it down? Uh, it's a good it? question that hasn't been discussed at this point, um, but certainly something to look at. Yeah. Thank you. Hi, Sue Beck from Children's Hospital of Philadelphia. Um, great study. So it looks like you have long-term expression, or at least you have long-term clinical benefit. Do you know what cells were transduced? And um, do you know if you found a stem cell that you were transducing? So it's a great question. So we did see it in all cell types, including basal cells. We have not rebiopsied people at 12 months to see if it's where it still is. We're, it's something that's under consideration, but it, most adults with CF prefer not to go undergo multiple bronchoscopies because they don't feel great after a bronchoscopy. Um, but it's something that we're considering. So we don't know the exact durability. Um, you know, you sort of can guess from maybe the mouse that it would be a couple of years, but we don't know that at this point. Obviously, we're going to continue to follow these patients out. And again, we're, we're considering whether or not it's reasonable in the interest of understanding the durability to ask some participants to have a second bronchoscopy at 12 months or longer. We do have a question online from uh, Jennifer Logan, who asked, have you tested for uptake of AAV in other organs than the lungs after inhaled administration in your animal models? Yeah, that's a great question. And yes, that was done in the NHPs. And there's really just no expression in other organs. So for the mRNA detection in situ by hybridization, have they done the sense controls? Because the AAV genome is plus or minus strand. So the, just the DNA itself will act like the RNA? Um, that's a very good question. I'm going to see, is Ken in the audience? I don't see Ken here. I don't know the answer to that question, but I will follow up with Ken Glasscock and get back to you on that, John. Thanks for the question. Deal, the last question before we have to move on. Um, Jennifer, I, this is an open label study, correct? So I was curious about what your thoughts were. Again, I think referring back to Patrick's point, the four plus fold increase in CFTR protein relative to the CF levels. Um, and then you, we see these large changes in the quality of life indices, but then neither of those really seem to be corresponding to what we would expect with the change in FUV1. What do you make of that? Yeah, it's it's a great question. I don't think we yet know. I mean, from animal models, you in the NHPs particularly, you can guess that maybe the peak expression is at three months, um, but why we're not seeing more 
again, we can't measure function at this point. And I'm not sure. I do wonder whether the quality of life measure is something to do with the fact that people are recovering from their colds and not needing to get IV antibiotics. We've seen that with other therapies, that if you don't have to get exacerbation treatment, that your quality of life is better. So that may be playing a role. But why we're not seeing higher levels of lung function, I I don't think we know the answer. This is the first time that we've ever been able to show expression um, in the lungs. And so I, it's still up for debate. Sorry, I wish I did, had an answer. That would be the key answer. If you could answer it for me, that would be fantastic. <laughs> Since I can't, we'll move to our next speaker. Thank you. A round of applause. Thank you. Our next speaker is Dr. Joseph Zabner from the University of Iowa, professor of medicine there, and he's going to give a historical, perhaps hysterical, I'm not sure, overview of gene therapy for cystic fibrosis. Okay, and then you can use the pointer here, mm -hmm. or, and there's to go. you have to do the first one maybe, then, here. Uh -huh. and then, then the clicker should work. Uh -huh. Are you able to see the blue tip? Yeah, okay, there it is. Yeah. Thank you for the for the invitation. I know. Uh, last month, you know, is we celebrated 30 years of our first gene therapy trials for cystic fibrosis. So I thought this was a very opportune time to review the history of gene therapy. The objectives of this talk will review the progress in gene transfer for cystic fibrosis. I'll focus on the hypothesis that drove these experiments at the time they were done. Some of the hypotheses in the, the, that I'll use in this talk were assigned ad hoc by me you know, do not completely represent what the investigators were thinking, but I thought it would be important for this presentation. And we'll celebrate the third year anniversary of the first gene transfer experiments. Conflict of interest, I'm a founder of a, a tally that I, now it's called Saparavind. So a journey of a thousand miles begins with a single step. So at the beginning, it was uh, walking and jumping. In 1989, Lapchi, Tsui, and Francis Collins and I published a cystic fibrosis transmembrane conductance regulator uh, using a technique called linkage disequilibrium. And again, it, when I was an intern when that happened, and I understood, remember reading his paper and getting caught on the part of walking and jumping and, and could not understand very well what it meant, but I read the per paper with a lot of interest. So as soon as that happened, the first hypothesis came up, is CFTR a channel or is it a channel regulator? As you can tell from the name, the, the, it, was, it was named Cystic Fibrosis Transmembrane Conductance Regulator without clear knowledge of what the function of this protein was. So the first gene transfer experiments were done in 1990, a year after the discovery of gene. And they were both using a technique called the SPQ assay, that is a fluorescent assay that is used to measure halide concentrations in the cell. The first one was, or they were done at the same time. One of them used lipid-mediated plasmid transfection using a vaccine virus to, to enhance the mRNA production. And the second one used a retrovirus. So they bo were both published within a week apart. The first one uh, from Iowa, they showed that expression of cystic, cystic fibrosis transmembrane conductance regulator corrects the defective chloride channel in cystic fibrosis airway epithelial cells. And as you can see here at time zero, they, if you express CFTR on these cells, within three minutes they become fluorescent. When they express the delta 508 uh, mutation, after three minutes there was no fluorescence. 
Similarly, Mitch Trump in uh, Michigan you know, was able to use a similar technique to show that we uh, uh, infection with the retrovirus, the fluorescence intensity went up on cells that were transduced with CFTR. So I'm going to call the lipid mediated gene transfer the first player in gene therapy and the retroviruses the second player. As soon as the, the, these uh, initial experiments were, were done, the hypothesis became, will CFTR restore the chloride current in airway epithelia from people with cystic fibrosis? And at that point, a third player showed up. And I'm going to analyze what we knew 30 years ago about these players. The lipid transmit in plasmids were easy to manipulate and produce, but the expression was transient. Retroviruses were difficult to produce, it integrated into the genome, it, and it required cell division. And the third one, the other viruses, they were easy to manipulate and produce, it, they had long tropism, and they do not integrate. So we felt more confident that they will not result in cancer. So the third player was the first one that took the stage for gene therapy trials. So they, as I mentioned before, other virus uh, had been known to have long tropi tropism. And interestingly, it's only an uh, animal that was affected by wild type adenovirus. It's a cotton rat. A cotton rat is a, it's a mouse, you know, he's been, uh, and it's the only animal model. In 1986, Dr. Graham developed a helper independent human adenovirus vector by removing E1 and E3 regions from the adenovirus. This virus could be complemented by the E1 region that had been used in 293 cells to immortalize them. So it could be grown cheaply and efficiently in 293 cells. And then the first paper I read was from Andreas Mastrognelli, who working with Ron Crystal show clearly other virus express lac C in cotton rats in airway, uh, airways. This is a picture from that paper from uh, Andrea Mastrognelli. He, you see an airway of a control uh, you see the cells are not blue. The, the cotton rat that was infected with the other virus expressing lac almost every cell in the airways be, uh, express lac -C. So at that point, it, 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 several groups uh, felt that it was time to test this in humans. The efficacy of a gene therapy or gene transfer approach can only be tested in humans. The toxicity can only be tested in humans. In Iowa, we decided we're going to try to minimize the risk by using the nose. The other two groups uh, went to the lungs. Ron Crystal had found that the adenovirus DNA in native airway when he did brushes of normal people. A lot of them had E1 region in their genome. So there was some concern that the E1 region that had been uh, identified in the genome of normal lungs could uh, complement the recombinant adenovirus and turn it into a wild type infection. So this is uh, from my biochemistry class. Every drug has a therapeutic index. If you give a high enough dose, you'll see efficacy and the higher the dose, the better. If you give a higher dose, you'll see toxicity. The higher the dose, the more likely you'll see toxicity. And the question is, is there a room for treatment with an appropriate dose before you see toxicity? So in order to test this, we had to find the right animal model. And I want to point out, it's always important to have the right animal model to make sure that you can test both toxicity and efficacy. And, and this is the Sigmund Hispidus. It was so invoked to do these experiments that we had to be on a waiting list to get these mice from, from the supplier. So we tested these first in, in, uh, on, by instilling uh, adenovirus that express CFTR into the lungs of these uh, mice. And we could find that there was uh, expression by immunocytochemistry we could find that there was a, a mRNA by southern blood. And we also found that they had a transient increase in antibody response that returned to baseline. And then it allowed us to give a second dose and again, another peak of antibody response. It appeared to be fairly safe. You know, most of the inflammatory cells uh, in the lungs, three days, seven days, and 14 days, look the same as controls. 
And relative to the question that was asked before, when we looked for other viral uh, genomes, we could find them in the lungs and in the bowel, but nowhere else in, in, the, in the mouse. So we were able to conclude that recombinant adenovirus is safe, at CFTR is expressed is in CFTR, and with high doses, it can be repeated. And again, at that point, we knew that an infection with the virus prevented a second infection, but nobody had ever done a secondary infection with 10 to the 12 or 10 to the 13 viruses, and we thought that was responsible for overwhelming the humoral response. So we came up with a hypothesis that recombinant adenovirus can deliver CFTR cDNA to the nose of people with CF, and that there will be no replication competent virus and no toxicity. So we did a, a, a human trial that was published in 93. We took a, a, the strategy of isolating a small area of the inferior terminate with a little applicator, apply the virus to a very small area in the nasal epithelia. We could biopsy that and show that there was no uh, inflammation. And by measuring nasal voltage, we could see that was a transient correction of the CF defect. We also were able to, to look for mRNA by RSPCR uh, on those biopsies. We could conclude at that point that recombinant viruses were safe in the nose, and we came up with a secondary hypothesis that the immune system will permit repetitive administration. And again, we were able to do this in a cotton rats before. This was done also by Ron Crystal, and I'm going to point out his study first. He and you know, aerosolize using a sprayer into the into the crina of CF people, adenovirus, and repeated the administration uh, three times. One of the reasons I want to point out his study first is that he came up with a very unique strategy to identify the uh, efficacy of the virus. He was able to to quantitate how much mRNA from the vector was expressed. And, com and compare that to, to the mRNA of CFTR, endogenous CFTR, that was being expressed, and express the data as a ratio of both of them. So he found that after the first administration, the majority of the patients had more than 5% of the CFTR that was seen endogenously. He was able to see the same thing after the second administration, but after the third administration, there was no mRNA. So he found that you know, repetitive administration of adenovirus was not going to be an option for gene therapy. We did a similar study with a, in collaboration with the University of Washington and applied the virus to, to the nose of people with CF. And here is a, a, a representation of the results. The change in voltage is, a, shows that with a low dose, we could see some improvement in the change in voltage with isoproteranol. When we repeated the dose with a higher dose, we still could see that, but in the last two doses where we were giving the highest doses of other virus, we were unable to see any changes in voltage. And what we could see is that after several administrations, the, the neutralizing antibodies really spiked up to the point that repetitive administration of other virus was not going to be an option. So what, from here we learned that other viruses are safe, but neutralizing antibodies prevent repeat administration. And we also learned that having the right endpoints is important. You know, vector-specific QRT-PCR from Rome crystal and nasal voltage. So the second player is retrovirus, and I'm going to not to say a lot about that because it's not being used in humans, but currently there are trials with the lentivirus that are being planned. So I'm going to go now to the cationic lipids. The cationic lipids had an advantage. There is no proteins, and in theory, they should be able to be redosed many times. So we did a study applying a cationic lipid to the nose of people with cystic fibrosis, and we found that we could uh, express CFTR, we could detect uh, mRNA, we could see a change in voltage with terbulin that it was uh, implying that CFTR was functional in the nose of the uh, people with CF, but the dose we're using was very, very high. So one of the things we added as a control was to add DNA alone without the cationic lipid. And to our surprise, we found that adding the DNA alone 
you know, was more effective in generating CFTR gene transfer than, than uh, catenoic lipid with DNA. So from the study, we learned that the, the catenoic lipids were very, very safe, but not very efficacy. Uh, the efficacy was very, very uh, low. So it had a very small therapeutic window, not because of the uh, toxicity, but because of the efficacy. So, but still, it could be used, and and the question was, could this be used for therapy? And I think this is the first uh, study that was truly a gene therapy trial. It was done in the UK, where they did repeated nebulization of non-viral CFTR gene therapy in patients with cystic fibrosis, a randomized double-blind placebo-controlled 2B trial. It was a huge trial out of 78 people, 78 people, with CF received a, a, a catalytic lipid with a DNA that expressed CFTR. 62 controls received only 0.9% saline. They received multiple doses every 28 days for a year. And, and the graph here shows the result of the PFTs. In red, you can see what happened to the control group, a, a slow decline over a year. And in blue is what happened to the treatment group. It, there was a, a maintenance of the FEV1 over a year, but the difference with the treatment group was in the control was very, very small. I took this from the paper. Their conclusion is that monthly application of PGM169 GL67A gene therapy formulation was associated with a significant, albeit modest, benefit in FEV1 compared with placebo at one year. So the, the catalytic lipid mediated gene transfer has to be more efficient in order to be able to function in a treating CF lung disease. So we did a study a few years earlier trying to, uh, to figure out why was catalytic lipid mediated gene transfer so inefficient. So in this paper, we found that it has multiple problems. You know, first, the uh, binding of the complexes to the airway epithelia is very, very low. The entry is very inefficient, and it enters by macropinocytosis. The second thing we found was that once it gets into the airway cells, it comes in in endosomes, and, and the, the complexes rarely leave the endosomes, and some of them go to lysosomes, and, and they get uh, degraded. And the third thing we found was DNA trafficking was a huge problem. In this experiment, we, I, we took the advantage of the PTM uh, vectors that can make mRNA in the cytoplasm by co-infecting them with the vaccine virus. And what we found was that if you use a transfection that allow mRNA to be transcribed in the, nucle in the, in the cytoplasm, we could get the efficiency to go up by three logs. So here is a one microgram of DNA with a, the with a vaccine virus, got 100% of the cells blue, whereas a, a one microgram of, a, of the regular plasmid did only 10% of the cells. And when you compare the doses, there was a three log difference in efficiency or, or greater. There are current trials on their way trying to transfect mRNA into the lungs to express CFTR, and I have high hope that that will make a big difference compared to the study that was done in the UK. So I'm going to talk a little bit about the, another player, so the, it's the adeno-associated viruses. Adeno-associated viruses were discovered by Nick Muchiska um, in 1982. They have a good safety profile. They have some problems limiting ca uh, packaging capacity. The FDA has approved it for several diseases, and AV2 has been extensively studied in people with CF. And, and the hypothesis, I think, from the studies that have been published is, is AV2 safe for aerosolization in people with CF? And again, that was reviewed in a, in a previous talk. The many, many studies were done. You know, most of them showed very little efficacy in FEV1, and here you can see the study of 51 uh, patients that receive AV, repetitive doses of AV into the lungs. But the important thing is that they were very, very safe. The repeated, 
Repeated doses of aerosolized AV2CF were safe and well tolerated, but did not result in significant improvement in lung function over time. I think this is a really good place to start because at least we know that AVs are very safe. We know that the toxicity in this in the serpent index uh, graph is very sh is shifted to the right. So if AV is safe for aerosolization in people with CF, you have two strategies. One strategy is to use higher doses that have been used so far or try to make them more efficient. And there is some evidence that higher doses could be used. This is a study that was also mentioned before, you know, from a For, for a treatment for spinal muscular atrophy. So the authors on this study, they use one time, times two times 10 to 15 AV intravenously in these kids that are uh, uh, have this disease. And this virus express the SMN1. And with this dose that is 100 times higher than the one that was used for the AV2 trials, these kids uh, uh, did really, really well, and this resulted in approval of this for, for, uh, by the FDA for treatment of spinal muscular atrophy. Again, the toxicity is shifted to the right. There was a, a, a case of a report that was reported before of a death, but these are kids that are very, very sick, and still the, this is an amazing medicine for kids that have a terrible disease. The second a, a strategy is to increase e e efficacy. So several years ago, in, co in collaboration with David Schaefer, uh, Katie Coffin took a library of AV capsids, infected uh, airway epithelia with this li library, you know, amplify the viruses that could infect by infecting the epithelia from the basal oral side, and then rescue the viruses that were infected, isolated them, and, and reconstituted the library, and did this on 15 different lungs. And after 15 different lungs, she, uh, we came up with a virus that we call AV 2.5T that was a lot better at infecting airway epithelia. And with this virus, if you infect CF airway epithelia that usually has no CFTR, here you can see the nuclei in blue and ZO1 in red. And what you can see is there is no CFTR in green. When, she, when Kate infected this epithelia with the AV 2.5T, you could see that many of the cells are expressing apical CFTR. And, and, uh, and in, a, in this unfalse view, you can see that it's the majority of the cells in epithelia can be infected with AV 2.5T. So we had a CF peak in, in the lab that we thought, well, now we can cure a CF peak with, a, with AV 2.5T. And uh, we put the virus on, again, the CF peaks don't express CFTR. You, you can see in blue the nuclear of the epithelia, in red CAR showing the adherence junction. And when we added AV 2.5T to, the, to these peaks, not a single cell expressed CFTR. That was quite disappointing. But we remember from cotton rats <laughs> that virus have animal tropism. So the same way other virus can only infect a mice a, a called Sigmundon hispidus, but not other mice. You know, these, uh, we uh, hypothesize that AV 2.5T is specific for human and not for pig. So we went again and tried to isolate a, a virus that would be useful for pigs. And then we did this in, in part of it in vivo, and we isolated a virus that was very different to 2.5T. We called it a, AV2 to H. To H32 C, uh, and made a CFTR version of that. For this virus, we could infect the pig airways in vivo. And here you can see a CF pig. In, in blue, you can see the nuclear in the, tra the, the trachea. In green, the cadherin showing the, the adherent junctions. And when we, in, in red, you can see CFTR. Well, you don't see CFTR because it's a null pig. When we infected the pig with the AAV2 H22 CFTR, we could see that the majority of the cells express apical CFTR, you know, that was completely absent in the null pig. So, new, more effective AVs are being tested in clinical trials, and I'm very hopeful that one of them might be able to, to work. 
So at this point, we're back to the central hypothesis. Can gene therapy treat or prevent CF lung disease? So Alan Smith, uh, he was a chief scientific officer of Genzyme, and he worked with us in the first gene therapy trial. And I remember every time we'd meet, he said, you're the, you're the physician scientist. How will we know that gene therapy worked? He had no doubt that eventually, he knew it was going to take some time, that we'd be able to develop the technology to transfer G CFTR to the airways. But he doubted whether we'll be able to know how to measure it in people to show that we had uh, accomplished th a, a therapy. And I think the ETI, uh, um, the treatments with ETI has shown us how to do that. So this is a study that was uh, published uh, about Ivacaftor, Tesacaftor, and Ivacaftor that showed that patients that were treated with this combination therapy, they sh had a 13% improvement in FEV1 that was sustained over 26 weeks. Raul Villacreses on poster 178 will show you that in nine patients that were treated in the University of Iowa and University of Washington, you know, he could identify by uh, analyzing the airways that the small airways that are plugged and unable to be registered in, in, a, in a CT scan were open and were able to register after Ivacaftor, Tesacaftor a combination therapy. And when he quantitated how many of these cells, airways can be counted, the fourth generation, the fifth generation, he could see more than three times more, more airways, suggesting that this is a very effective way to look for efficacy. So I think we have we we have we know how to do this now. We can look at airways and you know, count them, count them. We can look at FEV1, and we have a technology that restores CFTR, and that QCF will be able to know that. So in summary, gene transfer is uh, can be done safely in CF. After three years, new technology have solved many of the fundamental problems. Some questions can only be answered in humans, and the studies are being done. We need quantitative molecular endpoints to assess efficacy, and we need to select vectors that work in humans and not animal models that work for the vectors. And highly effective modular therapy paved the way to test the central hypothesis that CF can be cured with, CF, with gene therapy. Thank you. We have time for just one to two questions for Dr. Zabner, so we make sure we have adequate time for our final speaker. <laughs> He'll be available if anybody has a question. All right. Okay. Our next speaker is Dr. Martin Burke from the University of Illinois, Urbana-Champaign. And he's going to talk to us about a, a novel, out-of-the-box approach to correct CFTR deficiency. Oh, yes, I'm sorry. Yeah, let me help you here. Here we go. So I close that, and we pull you up here and start here. And I can. Start this here for you so you can just see Perfect. what your time is at. So much. Hours. And if you move that all the way over here, Perfect. you'll be able to use the mouse there and you can advance the slides. Perfect. Right Thank you. Great. Okay. Thank you so much again for the very kind invitation and for the opportunity to share our story. Uh, as mentioned, we're taking a different approach to try to figure out how to add the capacity for anion secretion in people with CF. We call this approach molecular prosthetics. It's a small molecule-based approach, so it's inherently outside the scope of some of the biological challenges uh, that we've been hearing about today, which we're hopeful could be helpful. And because it's an approach that's independent of the protein and therefore independent of the genotype, uh, our hope is that it could be helpful for everyone with CF. Just use the, the keyboard. Yeah, it's not moving. Oh, is it? 
<laughs> that works. Thanks. Okay, so we're, we're all aware of the challenge, and that is, of course, loss of the CF2 anion channel at the apical surface uh, leads to loss of capacity to maintain the proper airway surface liquid physiology. We recognize that this challenge also is accompanied by an opportunity, and that is the loss of normal anion transport across the apical membrane is in the setting of continues to be active basolateral pumps and channels that are continued to supply anions into the cell. So this should create then a pathophysiologic anion gradient, which could provide a very strong driving force for ions to move in the right direction in the right cells if there was an alternative pathway for them to be released. So the basic hypothesis here is that it doesn't have to be a protein that's enabling that anion release. It could, in fact, potentially be a small molecule. So the basic idea here is to add to the apical side of the membrane small molecule-based therapeutic that has the capacity to autonomously self-assemble to form an ion channel that is permeable to anions, which can then leverage that anion gradient and thereby restore airway surface liquid physiology. An important point to make here again is this is a small molecule approach, so it should be independent of the genotype. And hopefully it would be under the radar of the biological mechanisms that can make restoration of the protein itself uh, challenging. So rather than start by trying to design and create a new small molecule that could do this, we turn to nature. And it turns out there's a remarkable small molecule natural product called amphotericin B, which has been known for more than half a century to form ion channels in both yeast and human cells. And many of you might know it's actually already a clinically approved drug uh, used to treat fungal infections. Now, for a very long time, and as I was taught as a medical student, uh, everyone attributed the also known toxicity of this natural product to its ion channel forming capacity. The basic kind of mechanism that was understood is that amphotericin kills cells by forming ion channels, which of course would make it a very tough starting point for trying to replace a missing protein ion channel and thereby uh, restore physiology. So we had a hunch that that was not correct. And it's a very long story, but we were able to use synthetic organic chemistry uh, using a molecular modularization approach that we had developed where you can build molecules kind of like you would build Legos piece by piece. It allowed us to fundamentally understand this natural product operated differently uh, than everyone thought. It does form ion channels. You can see them uh, by a planar lipid bilayer and many other techniques. But it turns out this is not the primary mechanism by which amphotericin kills cells. The primary mechanism turns out, um, through studies that we had done in collaboration then with Chad Reinstra, who's now at Wisconsin, this remarkable natural product self-assembles into a clathrate-like complex that has the capacity to extract sterile molecules from both yeast and human cells, and it does so very quickly. And this is the mechanism by which it causes toxicity primarily. The channel formation is separate. And this gave us an opportunity. Fundamentally understanding that different mechanisms suggested it may be possible to separate the channel activity from the toxicity and thereby utilize this small molecule natural product almost like a billion year head start to test the hypothesis that you could replace the missing protein with the small molecule, almost op operating like a prosthesis on the molecular scale. So we started by testing this in some simple assays, looking specifically at whether you could improve bicarbonate secretion and whether that would thereby increase ASL pH. And we were very excited to have the chance to collaborate with Mike Welsh at Iowa to do these studies. We also were able to leverage the small molecule modulators, which had just come online when we started these experiments. Obviously, we know they can be very effective in the clinic. They also make great chemical biology tools in the lab because they can be used to turn on the CFTR protein in a way that we know is effective in the clinic. So it provides a great benchmark. So in initial studies, we had shown that if you treat, for example, CUFI-4 epithelia, which Mike's lab had developed from a person with CF with a G551D delta F508 heterozygote phenotype, if you add Ivacaftor, as you would expect, you see a very nice increase in the bicarbonate secretion. Now, in a separate experiment, if instead of activating the CFTR, you now simply add a small molecule that can spontaneously self-assemble, form an anion permeable channel, we see a very similar increase in bicarb secretion now, not by CFTR, but by the small molecule prosthetic. In both of those cases, we see a very nice increase in ASL pH, consistent with an expected recovery of ASL uh, physiology. 
One of the key advantages of this approach is that, again, because it's independent of the protein, it should be independent of the genotype. And Mike and colleagues also had developed, uh, as mentioned previously, a CF pig. This is a CFTR null pig, so they make no protein. And we were able to do an experiment in vivo here now through a surgically open tracheal window. You can add the molecular prosthetic directly to the surface of the epithelia. And in four out of the four pigs, we saw a very nice increase in ASL pH. We're also able to gain access, again, through Mike and his team at Iowa, to primary cultured airway epithelia from people with CF who had donated. Uh, in all of these cases included people who, some of which were uh, with nonsense mutations or mutations that would not necessarily be eligible for modulators. And we saw very nice uh, evidence that ASL pH goes up, the ASL viscosity goes down, and perhaps most importantly, we saw about a twofold increase in the capacity of the airway surface liquid uh, to kill bacteria. And importantly, amphotericin is an antifungal. It doesn't have any antibacterial properties on its own. So we attributed this to an increase uh, in the host defense properties of the airway surface liquid. Cognizant of the importance of the Oosting Chamber experiment and changes uh, therein and the in vitro in vivo correlations that allow us to think about the relationship between the impacts of modulators in the Oosting Chamber and what happens in people, we've been looking at this assay as well. Uh, Noemi Sellis in my lab uh, produced this data in which you can see, again, in the KUFI-4 background, which is the heterozygote G551D delta 508, we see a very nice increase, as you'd expect, caused by Ivacaftor in current. And at the same concentration, we see, again, a very robust increase in current caused by the small molecule. Building on this, uh, we were very grateful to team up with the Cystic Fibrosis Foundation and gain access to primary airway epithelia from people with CF with nonsense mutations, including three individuals who are homozygous for W1282X for nasal uh, epithelia. And as you can see across the board, current and conductance were all increased uh, via addition to the apical membrane of this small molecule ion channel forming compound. Building further into trying to get a sense of whether this could work in people, uh, we were very excited to have a chance to do a small clinical study uh, at Iowa with eight individuals who were at the time not on modulators uh, and look for whether or not adding amphotericin, which again is already clinically approved so we could do this study uh, directly in people, uh, adding it to their nasal epithelium and looking for changes in nasal potential difference. And as you can see here, seven out of eight individuals showed uh, the expected reduction in nasal potential difference. It was a statistically significant change, uh, about 2.9 millivolts in the negative direction. And importantly, this change was similar both in direction and magnitude uh, to what had been observed with Ivacaftor in the early studies with, um, uh, in the G551D uh, population. Okay, so with all this momentum, we began dreaming about a dry powdered inhaler that could allow this to be self-administered by people with CF uh, so they could add the capacity for anion secretion directly to their airways. Uh, we were very fortunate to have the chance to team up uh, with Jeff Weirs, who many of you I'm sure know, uh, really kind of the, the pioneer of a lot of the technology that allows uh, these types of deli direct delivery, including Toby Pothaler, uh, that technology. And so we also started a company called Systetic Medicines, uh, which uh, was able to help us bring this into a translational setting. And full disclosure, as I meant to mention at the beginning, I'm a co-founder as well as shareholder and paid consultant at Systetic Medicines. Okay, so there was a key challenge that we needed to address. And that was in those early studies, we had noticed something interesting that we didn't understand. So when we gave the amphotericin at low concentrations, we saw very nice kind of increases in ASL pH. But as we moved to higher and higher concentrations, we lost the effect. So originally we expected perhaps toxicity, but interestingly, we didn't see that. Uh, airway epithelia seemed to be very robust actually to amphotericin, and it didn't seem like the cells were actually getting uh, toxicity. So something else was going on. So we tried to dive in deep and really understand this at the basic science level, and hopefully that understanding could allow us to rationally design a dry powdered inhaler that could get this effect without worrying about overshooting and losing the activity at higher concentrations. And so we were able to repeat this result in primary airway epithelia, again, at low concentrations. We saw a very nice increase in ASLPH uh, caused by amphotericin, but if we went to 50 micromolar, uh, we actually lost the effect. So our first kind of guess was that perhaps we're losing the channel activity, maybe some shift in the aggregation state. Now we're moving into more of this sponge-like state and losing the channel function. 
But um, quite interestingly, what we saw here was, in fact, very robust bicarb secretion across the entire uh, concentration range. And the student in my lab, uh, Aga Lewandowska, who'd done these studies, uh, was very excited to see that, in fact, something interesting was going on that probably was much more kind of complex than we had originally thought. And teaming up uh, with Mike Welsh and his team, as well as Ian Thornell, uh, scientist at Iowa, uh, Aga and the team kind of decided to go all in to try to figure out uh, what was going on here. So one of the hypotheses that emerged is amphotericin, quite interestingly, will conduct anions, but it's not selective for them. And so we had kind of hypothesized from the beginning there may be concomitant leakage of monovalent cations, which we know it's also permeable to. And if you look at electrochemical gradients, there should be a driving force for potassium to leak out. When we checked the airway surface liquid, we actually noticed, interestingly, the potassium concentration was unchanged, even though the ASL pH was rising. And we expected that perhaps ATP12A, which of course is a pump that can put potassium back into the cell, may actually be, in a sense, helping us achieve homeostasis despite the lack of perfect selectivity uh, for the small molecule channel. And what we saw when we went from low concentration to high concentration was a very interesting increase in expression of ATP12A uh, in these epithelia. And that was commensurate with an increase in the WABAID sensitive flux, which is a way to measure the actual function of ATP12A at the surface. So it seemed like that there was an effect at higher concentrations in which we got much more ATP12A activity. So in order to try to test whether this was caused perhaps by this sterile extraction process or maybe it was just too much channel activity that was unselective, uh, we used a derivative that we created in which this is an amphotericin analog that does not form ion channels. Okay? By understanding that the channel activity was only responsible at the tail region, we could change that part and pretty much knock out the channel activity but keep everything else. And interestingly, when we did that, we saw mitigation of the increased expression of A212A, uh, mitigation of the Wabane sensitive current flux increase, and as expected, no increase in ASLPH because now we're not forming channels. But we are still binding and we think extracting cholesterol. So it suggested it's not really the lo loss of cholesterol, but too much channel activity that's causing uh, this to ha effect to happen. So we returned to our model, and our biophysical model suggested another possibility. Originally, we had thought low concentrations would be a great way to get there because we'd avoid uh, too much uh, uh, overactivity, but now we wanted to figure out a way to control that so that we didn't have to shoot too close to a specific concentration. And so there had been hints in earlier work that if we pre-complex the amphotericin with cholesterol, we stabilize this sponge-like state and that this perhaps could allow us to intentionally shift this dynamic equilibrium to the left, just give a slow leak of ion channels that allow us to get the desired effect but avoid overshooting in terms of channel activity. And when we look closely uh, at the stability of these sponge-like complexes, which we've been recently able to actually see at atomistic resolution in collaboration with Chad Reinstra, we can actually see that a Complexation with cholesterol does, in fact, cause a shift in what we call the melting temperature, uh, the temperature required to break this aggregate apart. And so this actually gives us a very interesting kind of rationale for how pre-complexation with cholesterol could shift that equilibrium and kind of buffer against this hyper-permeabilization uh, phenomenon. And very excitingly, if you now link amphotericin plus cholesterol, you can see in that same experiment, across a wide range of concentrations, we now sustain this capacity uh, to increase the ASL pH. This turned out to translate into the primary airway epithelia, where we can show that pre-complexation of amphotericin with cholesterol mitigates against the ATP12A expression uh, that we observed without it. it reduces that wabaid sensitive flux, and now in complexation with cholesterol, even high concentrations of amphotericin give us a very nice rise in ASLPH in the primary uh, cultured safe epithelium. Okay, so Aga pulled all of this together into a really, I think, exciting story in which we now understand at both low and high concentrations what's going on uh, with our system, which played a huge role in allowing us to move forward. So the current model is at low concentrations. We think we have kind of a nice slow leak of bicarbonate and per perhaps also chloride that's allowing us to recover airway surface liquid physiology. If we overdose, uh, give too high of a concentration with amphotericin without pre-complexation with cholesterol, we think we're getting hyperpermeabilization with the response being ATP12A overexpression, and it's a potassium influx, but then, of course, it's also pushing then proton out, ATP12A uh, counter exchanges. And it's that, we think, secretion of proton uh, that's causing uh, the 
ASL pH uh, rise to be mitigated and thereby losing the effect. However, if we pre-complex with cholesterol, we see a very nice opportunity to kind of buffer against that hyperpermeabilization by shifting our equilibrium, we think, to the left and just getting a nice slow leak uh, with our small molecule molecular prosthetic. Okay, so pulling all of that uh, basic science together and some really brilliant particle engineering by Jeff Weirs and his team, including Dan Miller, Tom Trara, Shirley Lyons, and the team at Systetic Medicines, uh, we've created what we call ABCI, which is Amphotericin B Systetic for Inhalation. It's uh, strategically formulated to allow us to have the maximum molecular prosthetic effect across a broad range of concentrations. And the composition, of course, now includes both amphotericin, but also strategically incorporated amount of cholesterol. We call this CM001. It's a drug device combination product. It comprises lipid coated crystals uh, that can be delivered now with a portable uh, passive dry powdered inhaler. When we add CM001 now to the surface of cultured CF epithelia, this being the KUFI-1 cell line, we see a very nice, robust increase in ASL pH. And consistent with these design criterion based on the story I just shared with you, we get a nice uh, sustained uh, activity even at very high concentrations. We now go to primary epithelia, and we can see, uh, as we had seen before, uh, across a range of different uh, backgrounds, donors, including those who have nonsense mutations, we see a very nice increase in ASL pH, both at low and high concentration. We see reductions in ASL viscosity. And again, perhaps most importantly, we see a very nice increase in the capacity of the airway surface liquid to kill bacteria. Okay, so I'm excited to share with you, we've now moved this uh, program into clinical studies. Uh, this is done in collaboration uh, with Colin Reisner and his team at DevPro Biopharma. Uh, these studies have been conducted in New Zealand and are being expanded to Australia. Uh, a phase one study involved three parts. Uh, so part A is a randomized double-blind placebo-controlled study, uh, single ascending dose in healthy volunteers. Part B is similarly randomized, uh, double-blind placebo-controlled, multiple ascending dose study, also in healthy volunteers. And part C is an open label study in people with CF uh, age 16 years or older. I'm very excited to tell you we've completed now uh, both the enrollment and the dosing for parts A and B. Thus far, the compound uh, drug has been very well tolerated, and I'll share with you the specific data from the part A where we've had a database lock and allowed me to share it with you today. And finally, uh, just last week, uh, we were able to dose our first person with CF uh, with CM001, which we're very excited about. Okay, so in the part A, this a single ascending dose study, uh, we're happy to report there were no serious or severe adverse events. Uh, all the reported adverse events were mild and transient, uh, with a similar incidence between the active and the placebo groups. The most prevalent adverse event was a mild headache. Um, there were no trends uh, in adverse events uh, associated with increasing doses. And none of the systemic adverse events that are often observed when you give amphotericin IV, uh, none of those were observed in this study. Uh, there were no reports of bronchospasm or dose-limiting pulmonary toxicities, such as wheezing or post-inhalation cough. And there were no other clinically significant outliers in terms of vital signs, ECGs, and clinical chemistries, et cetera. So overall, a very clean uh, study for the uh, SAD and healthy volunteers. Um, and things look really good for the MAD as well. And so we're excited to be moving into people with CF. Just a little bit of the PK data. So we're now looking at plasma, and it turns out a very small but measurable amount of the amphotericin that is inhaled ends up in the plasma, which is a nice opportunity to kind of keep your finger on the pulse. Uh, so it's very low amounts, but it is monitorable with very sensitive techniques. The plasma amphotericin B does increase with increasing dose in a dose proportional manner. And the maximum level that we see in the plasma is about 100 to 1,000 times lower than those that are known to cause uh, problems for, for example, kidney toxicity. So we think this is overall helps us monitor and keep things uh, very safe. Okay, so the last thing I just wanted to share, uh, Noemi Sellis in my lab has been looking into the question, might it be possible to combine the molecular prosthetics approach uh, with the modulators? And is there an opportunity to provide added benefit? As we all know, the, uh, for example, ETI does a really remarkable job of restoring CFTR function. 
but it's not back to wild type levels. And if you look at the biophysical level, it falls far short. So that should suggest there should still be a pathophysiologic anion gradient that could be tapped into. And we hypothesize this small molecule approach could be very complementary. And so interesting, if you look by Oosing chamber and you first treat uh, with Ivacafter or with the G551D Delta 508 background, as expected again, you get a nice increase in current. But then if you add amphotericin on top, you get another boost. We can see this is additive and it's statistically significant. Now, if you look back to the bicarb secretion and SLPH assay, again, in a heterogeneous background, either just adding ETI alone or just adding the molecular prosthetic alone, we get an increase in bicarb secretion. But now when you add the molecular prosthetic on top of ETI, you see a very nice increase in bicarb secretion, which does translate to an extra increase in SLPH. And we see the same thing in the double delta 508 uh, background. So these are early studies, but it's exciting to think that there may be an opportunity here because we have a different mechanism, in this case not limited by the stoichiometry of the protein that can be expressed and or activated to provide some added benefit in this patient population. Okay, so to briefly summarize, we'd like to say molecular prosthetics at least is a promising approach. There's a lot more to do and a lot more to learn. Uh, but for people with CF, including those who cannot benefit from modulators, uh, we saw nice activity in cultured epithelia from people with CF, as well as in a variety range of genetically diverse uh, primary epithelia from people with nonsense mutations. We rationally designed the dry powdered inhaler uh, based on a lot of uh, biophysical and mechanistic studies. Uh, it's now entered phase one, uh, looking very promising so far. And the person, first person with CF uh, was just dosed. And we're looking to initiate a phase two study uh, early next year. And there may be additive benefits of bringing molecular prosthetics and CFTR modulators together. Okay, with that, there's a tremendous amount of people to thank. Uh, I just want to make sure to mention uh, Mike Wells, Chad Reinstein, and Thornell, academic collaborators. Uh, remarkable group of students and postdocs and scientists in my lab, Aga, Corinne, Noemi, Kelsey, Jonathan, Danielle, Kate, Daniel, Caitlin, and Rajiv. Uh, the team at Systemic Medicines, uh, Jeff Weirs and his team, Tom, Dan, Shirley. Uh, Gina, Jeff, Catherine, and Jim McDonald. We've got a fantastic scientific advisory board who's been advising us, uh, Bonnie Dutch and Mike Constant. The team at uh, DevPro Biopharma, led by Colin Reisner, uh, who's just been fantastic. Additional support from NDA partners, uh, excellent support from our uh, funders. And I want to have a huge shout out to Emily's Entourage and Emily Kramer Golenkoff. Uh, Emily's Entourage believed in us before anyone else did and funded our earliest work in mechanism, preliminary results, and the nasal uh, MPD study at Iowa, which, for which we're tremendously grateful, and also for Emily's personal inspiration and empowerment she gives to all of us who care about this important problem, uh, as well as other funding mechanisms. Thank you so much for your attention. I'd be happy to answer any questions. That's, that's fantastic. Amazing. Couple of questions. The first one is these particles, how far into the airways they travel? Yeah, it's a great question. And we're still working to learn that. Uh, the good news is uh, Jeff and his team have developed the, this palmosphere technology that's been used in multiple other products, uh, including Toby Pod inhaler, and have really decades worked out uh, the kind of engineering of how to maximize getting the you know, drug into the right place, into the right airways at the right time. So we're benefiting from literally decades of work that's been done already by Jeff and his team. Uh, and CM001 has been built with all of that history built into it. And the second question is, how is it that this mechanism doesn't have a more profound effect on ion homeostasis? Yeah, this is a great question that's kind of puzzled us from the beginning of, you know, how is it that the system can maintain homeostasis despite the lack of anion selectivity for the small molecule channel? And I think a lot of people thought this wouldn't have an potential to work because of that issue. Our hypothesis is based on the inherent robustness of the living system. Anion secretion is what the epithelia, right, are born to do. And they have many other mechanisms that help control that homeostasis. So even though we know we're probably leaking out potassium, but there the ATP12A can act as kind of a recovery mechanism to bring the potassium back in. And I think the key hypothesis that's been driving us the whole time is that imperfection is enough. You know, even if you lose, for example, a hand, Right? Uh, a relatively simple prosthetic device can actually restore a whole lot of positive function. And this is because you get creative and work harder with your other hand and find ways to get back uh, to normal function as much as possible. So I think on the macroscopic scale, imperfection is enough. And we think that's going to prove to be true at the molecular scale, which actually opens up for a lot of possibilities of this molecular prosthetic approach. Thank you. 
Hey, Steve. Hi, Stephen Rowe. Uh, Marty, thank, thanks so much for that presentation. It's great, great, great to see it progress so uh, so well and so clearly. I have a question specifically about the cholesterol compensation in the latest formulation. And I could see, you explained it really clearly about how that would increase your buffer, if you will, um, uh, to push up high concentrations, still get the intended effect uh, with, with it. But what I would have also expected is that the potency on the low end might also have been affected. Do you see that? And 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 to what extent uh, do we need to mitigate against the risk of lower concent effective concentrations of the drug in that setting? Yeah, great question, Steve, thanks. Interestingly, if you just look at the amphotericin plus the cholesterol, we do see exactly what you just said. There's a small but noticeable shift in terms of potency at the lower concentrations. That said, it's still pretty remarkable how quickly you get up to uh, maximum, but there is a shift, and we've seen that, actually. We also can see in oozing chamber, there's a marked uh, reduction of channel activity, et cetera. Um, and, but yet, uh, what we think is happening is that a little bit is enough. It's like almost like a slow leak as opposed to uh, something over the, you know, that you need to be too extreme to get to that result. But what's remarkable, that's what we're seeing so far with ABCI, is that it doesn't seem to have such a drop off. And we're thinking that this may have something to do, sorry, I'm going the wrong way, uh, with the lipid formulation. And we're not sure why. Uh, but if you look actually at the, uh, the data with ABCI, it still rises very sharply. And uh, there may be something about the way the lipids much easier integrate into the airway surface that are making that possible. So it's an early result, but that's where we are. I understand that. That helped me understand it. Thank you. Um, uh, Follow-up question: Do you does it alter its? Does it still have in the current formulation antifungal properties? And does this alter alter that? Yeah, it's, a, it's another really great question. So yes. ABCI does maintain antifungal properties, and we're going to be thinking very carefully about how to make sure that we don't have that effect drive something that we would see clinically. It's a it's a great topic. Um, you know, ultimately at the end of the day, it would just be hopefully an added benefit. But of course, we want to understand what the molecular prosthetic mechanism is doing. Current thoughts are really around stratification. As you know, it's very difficult to necessarily say yes or no. Someone does or doesn't have a fungal infection. It's a tough thing to test. Uh, so as long as we can, we think stratify to make sure that any placebo and treatment groups have a similar amount of that in both sides. That might be the best way to try to address it. But it's an important question. We're going to continue to think about. Thanks. Yeah, Martin Mendes here, Foundation. Marty, very nice. I was curious if in your studies you've come across sort of potential differences between uh, CF and normal epithelia as far as the chloride uptake from the base. I mean, that's one of your underlying mm -hmm. hypotheses that you have enough chloride coming in to be basically leaking out through your amphotericin channels. And I think there have been studies suggesting, or at least anecdotal observations, that maybe in the case of CF, like the uptake mechanisms are epigenetically downregulated. So there's maybe less capacity for that. Have you sort of compared um, applying amphotericin to wild type mm. epithelia, normal epithelia to CF, do you generally see a similar level of um, you know, leakage currents that, that you measure? Or has it come across at all in your studies? Okay, great. So we don't have data on chloride specifically, but what I can tell you is we don't see changes in ASLPH if we treat wild type epithelia. It's very interesting. Uh, it's only when we're in the pathophysiologic state, which we attribute to this kind of pathophysiologic gradient that is the driving force. Uh, if you add amphotericin to wild type, it doesn't really seem to do much. And so we think that's also perhaps why, if you notice, when we go higher, it's not like the effect keeps going up. It seems to come back to this base, you know, to this ceiling and then just sits there. We think what's happened there is you've reestablished natural homeostasis. The, the system is kind of reaching a point at which it's balancing everything out. And really the way we think about it is, all we're doing is allowing the system, which has a kinetic barrier now, as part of its normal homeostatic mechanism, we're releasing that kinetic barrier and allowing the system to find its way back to homeostasis. So if it's already at homeostasis, this doesn't do much. If it's disbalanced, it just allows the system to get itself back to where it wants to be. Thanks. Yep. We are right at time, so I think we will not be able to do a panel discussion, but I'll ask our uh, next questions or any questions to all of our speakers if you can uh, hold them in the room because I think we have the space for a little while. Thank you to all of our speakers for your outstanding presentations and I'll leave it to Dr. McLean.